of, of being helpful. All right, so this is the, the easier form to draw, but technically you would get both of these products in approximately equal amounts. Gotcha. I guess what's what's hard for me to see on six, because uh, I can see it there, it's hard for me to see where they attach, like how they attach. So a good way to, to do this- like Where they attach. Yeah, a, a good way to approach this might be to start by um, drawing reorienting the, the reactants in a way. So if we know that this is our diene and I'm just gonna rotate it just a little bit. And then if you have a different color that might be helpful, but what you can do is say, you know, underneath that, you've got this molecule coming in, right? And so if you picture this top one as being flat, as being um, you know, a pancake, and then this one's coming from behind, or you could draw it on in front, either way, but you need this carbon, these carbons to be lined up next to each other. So when there's a ring structure, it just gets tricky to visualize. If this oxygen wasn't here, it'd be a lot easier to see what was going on, right? So let me erase the oxygen and let's just say, okay, we remember the oxygen there, but I'm just not gonna draw it for a second. If I do it like that, that's a lot easier to see what's going on, right? Yeah, 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 okay, got you, got you, got you. And, and then you can say, okay, well, all my all my bonds are moving, all my pi bonds are moving. I'm making new new bonds, and then you just have to remember to go back and add that oxygen in the middle. Gotcha. Right, so find your find your diene and your dienophile, line them up so that you can see, can see that six sided ring. Yeah. And then add all the rest of the stuff that you know is on there might be the best approach. Okay. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Those, those ones are really tricky, especially it takes practice to be able to draw them too, which is also frustrating to think you have the right product, but not be able to draw it properly. All right. I'm just going to go in the order of uh, who showed up when. So, uh, Elke, do you have any questions? It's also okay to say no and just listen to see what everybody else wants to ask. All right, we'll come back to Elke. Hey, Stephanie? Can we do a mechanism one? I don't really mind which one. Maybe, no, I don't yeah. like <laughs> Um, Let's, uh, I'm gonna switch to doing this. Let me grab my stylus and uh, plug in my tablet here. So I think that that works better for showing, showing these mechanisms. Let's look at the first one. Um, so this one's going to be a Grignard region. So remember the key with the mechanisms, what I'm looking for is, is not just the intermediates. I want to see the electrons moving. So any bond that breaks or any bond that forms, I want to see it. Um, so where are the electrons coming from? Where are they going? And so that it kind of is one of those things like balancing reactions a little bit. If you're if you have the time, if you're not under a high stress time situation like you would be, um, then you you should be able to go through and say, okay, I added this kind of bond. Where did those electrons come from? And sort of like, just like balancing a reaction, you should always be able to check your answer. And so that kind of shows you how many arrows you need to draw for each step. Um, 
And remember, we're always showing where is where are the electrons themselves moving. So you're always going to be drawing arrows from electrons, from bonds, or from lone pairs towards a positive or a partial positive. All right, so let me we'll share screen here. All right, so this one, this is a Grignard reagent one. <clears throat> and so remember, Grignard reagents are anytime you've got this magnesium bromide attached to something. And the general gist of these is always going to be that the Grignard reagents turn a carbon into a nucleophile. So if you can picture what, what the nucleophile is, then the thing we want to look at this molecule that we're starting with, and we want to say, okay, where's the partial positive? Or where's the positive charge? Because the nucleophile is just going to attack the partial positive. All right, there we go. So we have this methyl group attached to magnesium bromide. And so the methyl, because carbon is more electronegative than magnesium, the carbon's got a partial negative and it's gonna take, it's gonna be what the um, atom that gets to keep the, keep the electrons. All right, so it's gonna come in here and it's gonna attack the partial positive, which is going to be, in this case, it can be any carbonyl, um, really. It's going, it can even just be a, an aldehyde or a ketone. Um, it could even be it's just a good leaving group. If you have a bromide on our on a carbon, that could be a, um, a good enough leaving group that we can have a Grignard reagent to tack it. And so to make room for that, though, you need to move the electrons. And so rather than break a sigma bond, the first thing we do is we're going to break a pi bond because pi bonds aren't as strong as sigma bonds. And so the first step is going to lead us to this intermediate. We're also going to make leftover magnesium bromide is still going to be floating around just as an ionic compound, but that's not, again, this is OCAM. We don't care about it that much. Um, so you could still write, you could either write it over here and write minus magnesium bromide to indicate that it's just, you know, dropping out of solution, um, or you can just even leave it entirely. <clears throat> right, but the thing is, that an oxygen with a negative charge is okay, but what's really going to be more stable is we still have a carbon that has a partial positive on it. There's still a partial positive here because it's got two oxygens attached to it. So the fact that it says excess uh, methyl magnesium bromide means that there's more of this around. And we still have a good partial positive target for it. So we're just going to do the same thing again. We just have to then decide, OK, which of these oxygens we need to break another carbon oxygen bond. So we have to decide which of these oxygens is a better leaving group. Well, we already, if we broke the bond to the carbonyl oxygen, the former, the oxygen formerly known as a carbonyl oxygen, um, then we're going to wind up with an O2 with an oxide ion just floating around, which isn't very stable. So what we see instead 
is that we break this ester linkage. And so when we do that, we're going to wind up with two methyls added to um, the carbon that used to be the ester carbon. So if we're counting oxygens, it was, or counting carbons, it was five carbons in a row. And then before we had these connected and we had an oxygen on one, an OH on one end or an uh, ether linkage on one end. Right. And so the last step is just going to be what well, we, the mechanism. And again, with these, I'm going to ask you about, um, I'm going to give you the products. Although on number three, I'm not going to show you necessarily what the stereochemistry is for the electro or for the uh, cyclo additions to the electro cyclo and have you show me that with molecular orbitals. But for one and two, I'm going to give you the product so you know, okay, I'm almost there once you get to this point. I got the, the ring structure opened up, but I still have these charges here. So second step is just adding water. Once you get to this point, there's nothing else you can do with the magnesium bromide, with the Grignard reagents. Grignard reagents, won't they're not strong enough to push an oxygen off. So once you get to this point where you've broken all the oxygen bonds that you can, all that's left to do is we add water, which uses up the extra magnesium bromide, and it also is a proton source here. So we were just going to have I suppose I should switch colors again. So we do a quick proton transfer, do that for both of them. And we get to our final product. Right, so the, the key for these reduction reactions, reduction reactions are always going to look somewhat the same. We're, for our reduction reactions, for our, our um, carbon oxygen compounds, they're always going to look, we're always going to have either a hydride source or a carbon source or something that where you have a nucleophile and you're going to be breaking a carbonyl bond. All right, so it's basically just treating the carbonyl carbon like a target for a nucleophile. And then it's just a matter of showing the steps that you need to get to. If it was in a one-to-one -one ratio, if it didn't say, um, if it didn't say excess met methyl magnesium, then we would need to look more specifically, okay, is that gonna ring open or and leave, make an alcohol and a carbonyl, or is it gonna make two alcohols? Um, and, or is it going to make an alcohol and an ether? What is, you know, there are other things, but the fact that it says excess methyl magnesium bromide, actually, it makes it a longer mechanism, but it makes it a simpler one. There's less to actually worry about because you're just going to break all the carbon oxygen bonds that you can. Right. And any of the others. So this one was a little bit trickier. This, um, so you, but this was essentially that Williamson ether synthesis. We're making an asymmetric ether. 
Um, and so the again, the key is to remember what each of these steps, if the, you have the numbered steps in a mechanism, there each of those steps is going to do something specific. In this case, the NaH is a good way to irreversibly uh, deprotonate an alcohol. So it turns it from from this tertiary alcohol into um, into the and again this is not showing all the work for right now. We we'll, can go back and do that in a second. We're going to deprotonate the alcohol, and that that generates hydrogen gas, which is why it's. Um, and why it does this irreversibly, because then the hydrogen gas bubbles out of the solution and it's gone. So you can't reprotonate. But that effectively, what that does is that turns our alcohol into a really good nucleophile. And then the second step is add ethyl iodide. Well, ethyl iodide has a really good leaving group. You got a really good nucleophile and a really good leaving group. Your nucleophile's negative charge or partial negative is going to come in and attach to the partial positive on your, it's technically an electrophile, but from our perspective, we can think of it as just having a really good leaving group. So, Again, it's all, all about all, most of our reactions and mechanisms at this point are identify your nucleophile and identify what the nucleophile's target is going to be. And try and follow that through. And so in this case, we had to make our nucleophile. So again, knowing that sodium hydride deprotonates alcohols is really helpful. At the very least, if I was approaching this as on an open book test and I didn't know what the sodium hydride did, my first thought would be, well, I don't recognize this reaction, but I know we had a whole chapter on alcohols. And I'd go back to that chapter on alcohols and look at the reaction summary and say, okay, there it is. I found sodium hydride. And then that still might not show you the mechanism in the re in the review, but that at least narrows it down to what section. Okay, this is a, um, you know, what section of the textbook am I looking at here? And then you can go back and look at, okay, oh, sodium hydride, that was to make the nucleophile, to deprotonate the alcohol. Um, and I believe I've fallen behind. I think that there's a couple chapters that I don't have the re reaction summaries posted yet. Um, I will do that when we're done with um, with the review session today. Make sure I get those up for those of you who don't have access to a textbook or just like having them saved, um, pulled out of the textbook itself. Stephanie, did you have any any specific questions about mechanisms as a whole, or just wanted to see some practice? I just wanted to see some practice. Thank you. No problem. All right, Cody was the next one in here. Cody, do you have anything you wanted to ask about, or are you just hanging out? Uh, mostly just hanging out. Um, but if I could ask a question about that previous mechanism we did, not to be uh, nitpicky about it, but I had a slightly different uh, additional step before the second nucleophilic attack. I had like a rearrangement with the deprotonated oxygen forming a carbonyl, and that is what opens up the ring. Would that be wrong, or that's all good there? No, that that's also um, I, that's also a valid step. So basically, before. Before we get the second Grignard reagent in here, you have the oxygen with the negative charge. Here's our new methyl. Um, you can have this step happen. It's not a compound that we're going to be able to isolate very well. Um, 
so this would be this would probably be a more complete way of showing your work and i believe that's the way that the textbook shows it is it shows you reforming the carbonyl um, because the the logic is that a ketone and a deprotonated alcohol are more stable than two deep two um than an ether and a deprotonated alcohol we have really two choices right we can leave it leave it like this or we could have it We could have it like that and that's I didn't draw the angles very well to still leave most of the ring structure where it was we wound up making a ketone there really right. Yeah that's what I was thinking you know, just making sure that's a legit step. Yeah you're you're absolutely right and that keeps us with the that's a little bit more consistent because then we still have a carbonyl that's the target for the Grignard reagent so this is probably slightly better because then we can still have our our Grignard reagent come in here and attack. And then it looks a lot like the very first step, which is you break the carbon oxygen pi bond to make room for the Grignard reagent to come in here. The net result is the same. This is a little bit better. Um, it's not something that's we're ever going to get be able to get it to stop at that ketone plus the deprotonated oxygen. So it's a little bit of, of a hypothetical anyway. It's not that critical. Um, but this, yeah, this is just like showing your work and um, a little bit more. Cool. And for like the cyclo addition reactions, Anytime you're starting with like a cyclopentane as you're um, dying, you're gonna get that weird kind of boxy shape with the part of the ring structure pointing up. And then if you start with uh, uh, like a six-sided ring or something, then you get like a benzene plus additional ring. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good practice. Let's do a deals alder where we wind up where we have a our diene is a cyclohexadiene. Let me let me switch to a. Is the whiteboard on the um, on the touch screen work better for you guys, or can you see it better if I use the physical whiteboard? Six of one. Yeah, either way is good. All right, so if we start with a dying, so it looks like this, it's a little sloppily drawn, but cyclohexadiene. Then when we, and we, if we just make our, we'll use the same Diana file that we had before. So if we line these up the way we did before, line your Diana section up with your Diana file underneath it, and we can kind of leave off the other piece. So if we leave off the ring structure here, then that's what we'll do. So the rest of that, that ring structure is still there. We're just gonna not show it for right now in the interest of, of not confusing ourselves. So the rest of those other two carbons are still there though. So we're gonna still gonna get cyclohexadiene again. And actually I should draw this the other way. Since we're gonna be making the endo form, 
it's really going to look like that. So if we if we redrew it at our product as a flat molecule, <clears throat> oops, and we broke one of those. So we have our two carbons that are the top of the ring structure. And that's kind of hard to see what's going on there. So I can try and shade it in a little bit. Those are the two carbons that complete that original ring structure. And then we wind up with our aldehyde is kind of down and away from us in this situation, which, so this allowed us to line everything up well, but you see why we don't usually draw it like this, right? Because this is really a mess to see what's going on once, you, once we have it drawn like this. But now we can come back and say, okay, here's my two Vs. And instead of just having a point connecting the two of them, you have two carbons connecting them. There's the pi bond that's left over. There's the two I added. And we showed it with the aldehyde attached on the back carbon, but it could be on the front carbon as well, as long as it's in the endo position, pointed towards the rest of the, um, the remaining pi bond. Right, so, and the way to draw these is just like drawing the when you start with a five-sided ring and you just have a point connecting these two, the front and the back carbons, right? It just looks like that. Well, if you have two carbons in between the front carbon and the back carbon, it's just more of a box looking shape. All right, so it would be more like, and it's gonna look a little bit weird. There's nothing you can do about it to make it look, to make it look pretty, really. Um, even when we do this on Molview and ask Molview to clean it up, it's going to make the bond angles look weird. So the best you can do is make sure you get your number of carbons right, make sure everything's connected the right way, and do your best to have it pointed the right direction when it comes to like end over segzo. I bet it's just these. Even if we look at one of the prof a professionally drawn one, um, they're going to be they're going to be pretty weird looking as well. Um, It's not even going to let me do that. It's more or less what I have drawn, right? It just looks, the bond angles look weird because trying to use lines on a flat piece of paper to show such a complicated 3D structure looks weird. Um, really, what we're what we'd be looking at is something that looks. <clears throat> if I can get this oriented the right way, there's oriented more or less the same way as what we have here. And then, as far as the sub substituents, the substituents on the diene are going to be pretty much unaffected. They'll stay sp two, but the substituents on the dienophile are going to be endo or exo. Yes, um, mostly, so because we're going to wind up with, and I guess I left off a of pi bond here, um,
so because we're we're leaving it as being and getting these 3D structures to go where you want them to go is kind of tricky sometimes. There you go, that's not that bad. Um, you see that these two carbons that still have the pi bond are still sp2, right? And if they're still sp2, um, then they're going to be planar. There's no endo and exo on that side. So that simplifies things. And on the side that has the, the um, both ring structures attached to it, the carbons that where we have our new pi bond, those are now sp3, but we don't have a whole lot of freedom with how things have to be arranged, right? Because we only have one place that the substituent could be attached where these hydrogens are right now. So it's always got to be pointed away from the rest of the ring structure. And so we don't need to show that. Um, yeah, let's see what it would look like if I did add one on here and hit 2D to 3D. You know, you can't really imagine it going anywhere else. That still kind of keeps this more or less at an SP, as a, a, a tetrahedral shape. Right, so the only ones where we really have to worry about it is if we added something, if we have substitutions on our Diena file, because those can be exo versus endo. So um, the endo versus exo, wow, that's complicated looking. Let's see if I can, what happens when I do that. Uh, that's all right. It flipped our molecule around on us, which I don't like, but. Um, we so now our remaining pi bond is on the right hand side, but so here are our two positions: the two hydrogens attached to what was our dienophile. Here's our exo position because it points away from everything else, and our endo position points towards the remaining pi bond, at least vaguely. All right, so. We'd consider this bottom <clears throat> hydrogen the endo, this our exo. And I've got a request for um, going over nomenclature, and we'll do that after we give Emily a chance to ask a question. Um, Emily, do you have anything specific you wanted to go over? Um, just some like. Um... No, not at this point in time. Thank you. Okay. Me. No worries. If, if you think of anything, don't hesitate to uh, to jump in. All right. So there was a request to talk about naming epoxides and sulfides. And so the, um, the section on naming these is in when we're, so it's uh, chapter 13. So epoxides, Frequently, we'll have a common name, but based, but the easiest way to name it is just with a prefix. We just use the prefix epoxy. We just say which end we were, for whatever reason, it was decided that we don't need to specify both ends of an alkene, but we do have to specify both ends of an epoxy. So we just need two numbers in front of an epoxy that tell you what two carbons your group or in front of sometimes you just see these written as oxide you, you would instead of a prefix that says epoxy you would see pentine two three oxide or two three pentane oxide but this is the way that's more systematic is to just use epoxy as a prefix um so if we wanted to Let's say we're going to name this compound here. Find your longest carbon chain. And then, and so our, our longest carbon chain in this case is just three carbons long. So it's just going to be a propane. It's got a methyl attached to it. Uh, 
and I can't get it to go where I want it to go now. Um, we'll just do that. So methylpropane. It was a larger molecule. Again, we would specify where the methyl is attached. It being propane, we know that methyl means it's on carbon too, because that's the only place you can put a methyl on propane. So then the, the epoxide, we just put epoxy in front of it. And we just specify, in this case, again, it can only really go between carbons one and two, but it's a less, less standard functional group. So it's never a bad idea when you're unsure, include that extra number in one, two, epoxy, methylpropane. I mean, we can see how it, the epoxy needs to be, it, by definition, is going to be between carbons one and two, because if it was two, three epoxy propane, we would just be counting from the other side, and we would still name it one, two epoxy propane. But it's, so it's just more of the same, just a prefix we're going to use. And when in doubt, um, as you can usually assume that whatever you're adding has a prefix you could use. Even something like an OH group, you can call it a hydroxy group and name it with a, with a prefix and not be too far off. That's a common enough, alcohols are a common enough functional group. I would expect you guys how to name, name it with a suffix. But um, if you get into a bind or you're totally blanking on things, if it's closed book, you can just plain up make up a prefix and give it your best shot. With the sulfurs, you're probably going to be wrong because they have weird names like mercapto um, or thio. But with a lot of these others, just, I know it's supposed to be a prefix. Probably throw something there and see what happens. Um, as far as naming sulf sulfurs, so if it's a if it's an SH, that's the sulfur equivalent of an alcohol, right? So that's a thiol. And so we're going to name it just like it was the alcohol. Just instead of ending adding just ol to the end, we're going to add thiol to the end. Right, so normally we'd go through this and say, okay, here's my longest continuous carbon chain. Um, so that's that would be cyclo pentene. And then thiol, we just add. You can say one cyclopentene three thiol. Hey, Sean, would you want R or S on that one? You would want R and S. Right. And these ones, even I would go back and double check um, if you wanted, because you could, you can name these with a prefix. And I believe the prefix for a thiol is mercapto. Um, so you would say like three mercapto cyclopentene. Um, but again, and I, remember that's that interesting uh, if you expose a, be expose mercury metal to sulfur it makes a compound that won't dissolve in pretty much anything it makes mercury sulfide um, and so mercapto literally comes from captures mercury um, which is an interesting historical note not super helpful when it comes to remembering these things but that's it's not just they didn't just totally make it up at random like some of these things um 
chemists are at least better at that than biologists in most cases. Biologists, which has been named after whoever discovered it, or, you know, like luciferase is the enzyme that, um, that makes uh, lightning bugs light up. And it's named, it's called luciferase after um, Lucifer because Lucifer's name translates as the light bringer or something like that. So they just like, ah, it lights up. We're going to name it Luciferase and people will be able to remember that. Or morphine for that matter, named after the God of dreams, I believe Greek, Greek or Roman God of dreams, Morpheus. adds an interesting underlay to the matrix when you know that Morpheus is, is the uh, god of dreams in mythology. A little subtext there. Um, any of the other molecules in there? So sulfide, if it says dimethyl ethyl sulfide, that's the way we name the ethers. We don't have a good systematic way of naming ethers. Like, uh, sorry, thioethers. With ethers, we would say like, you know, isopropoxy propane or something like that. For the sulfurs, we don't have as good of an option. So you're just naming both sides of the, of the thioether. So dimethyl ethyl, methyl ethyl is an isopropyl group, right? So that's what that compound looks like. If I gave you the structure and asked you to name it, if it was something like like that, where you've got, and normally if the sulfur was an oxygen, this would be an ether and we would name this methoxycyclohexane. If it's an sulfur, it's a thioether, but we don't name it as methyooxy or anything like that. We just name both sides of it. So this would be methyl cyclohexyl sulfide. You just put the two pieces together. So you're just naming both sides of the thioether like they're a branch. Sean, so either of those two names that you went through would be acceptable for that one? Um, I, I think that this is really the only, the only option for this one because we don't, there is not a prefix way of naming these. I don't think you would, you wouldn't say, I don't think that there's a way, at least there's not a common way of saying like methyo or something like that. Methyo cyclohexane is not a thing. That's not a, so we just, um, with these thioethers, they're less common molecules. And so we don't have the rules as fleshed out. And so it's just name both sides like a branch. It doesn't matter the order, methyl cyclohexyl sulfide or cyclohexyl methyl sulfide. Oh no, that one that you said, the one cyclopentene three thiol. Oh, yeah. So either of those would work. Either of those options. Um, gotcha. Either you could either say three mercapto. As long as I'm, somebody want to double check. Mercapto means a, a thiol group, right? So anybody have the book open in front of them? Nobody does. I'll just double check it real quick. I think I read that um, on Sunday, so sounds right. Okay. Just double checking. I'm glad I have that. Yeah, we'll just, we'll go with that. Mercapto is your prefix for thiols. So we could do it. And this would be the way that you, it might be um, a little bit more in keeping with how we Normally name things. 
cyclopentene, and then the prefix would be three. If cyclopentene is going to be one and two, then on carbon three, be three mercapto. Again, sounds like a superhero. Mercapto man. Um, and then we would just go through and we'd want to name this as R versus S, which one, two, three, looks like it's going to be R. Priority one to the sulfur, two to the side with the pi bond, three to the other side. So clockwise, R. Perfect. Thanks, Emily. All right. You guys want to take a break and come back in a few minutes? Are we good? And you guys, have, anybody have any more questions for me? Brian Urian has this, uh, the art instructor, he's on a bunch of committees with me and he has this habit that uh, makes everybody a little uncomfortable where before he moves on in a meeting, when he's leading a meeting, he waits, for, has to wait for 10 seconds of nobody saying anything um, for everybody to have a chance to unmute themselves, find their unmute button and everything. But 10 seconds is a long time. Um, all right, so at this point then, I think I waited close to the 10 seconds. Um, is there any length limit to the lab final? No, I would expect it to be in the, you know, if you're double spaced, probably in the, the uh, and doing the procedure, three to four pages range, but I'm not gonna um, mark you down if it's shorter than that. Brevity is always a good thing. Um, if you can convey what you need to convey in less space, that's usually better, especially in the sciences. Um, John, what, what are your office hours for? Are they just normal office hours or are they just by email or? Um, so office hours are gonna be the same as normal this week. Um, and today uh, that includes lab. We're not doing anything in lab other than it's, I'll have my Zoom open um, and you guys can jump into um, in there. And let's, let's just actually from, from here on out, all of the, all of the Zooms will always be in my office hours link because that's the one, one that my Gen Chem students have as well. Um, so when in doubt, try that link. Don't go to, to this one anymore. Just go to the office hours link. Um, so yeah, today, 1030 to 1130. Tomorrow, 230 to 4. Thursday, 1030 to 1130. Um, I'll, and let's say, let's say uh, 9 o'clock forward. Yeah, you know, since we're not meeting for lecture on Thursday as well, we'll do nine nine to eleven thirty basically. So extra office hours on Thursday if you need it. Hopefully you guys are all finishing everything up by then, ready to take your your test and be done for the quarter. Um, but uh, I will still be around. And then if you need something outside of those normal hours, email me and we can set something up. Um, you know, you're not limited to those. I do have some flexibility this week. Just let me know what, what I can do that would, would be helpful for you, especially if you have a very specific question. Um, you know, you can try email as well, or we'll set up a Zoom, a time that works to Zoom. All right. Well, let's, it's 9.30. Um, how about we take a 10 minute break? And then I won't be offended if anybody logs off and just comes back for office hours if you have questions later. Um, and for what it's worth, I will post this video once we're done with this with this review session uh, on the um, week 12 link on the Canvas site. All right, so let's come back at 940 if anybody still has questions.
All right. I'm back. If anybody has come up with any questions in particular to ask. While you guys think about it. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, the, the lab final, I don't have a maximum length on it either. And if you're, if you, you know, depending on your formatting with numbering, if you have everything written out as numbers, um, it could easily balloon up pretty quickly um, above five, six pages. That's, that's totally fine. Um, I'd rather be able to read it than have you make the font smaller or something like that. Um, as long as you're communicating the information that needs to be communicated, then I'm going to assume it's the right length for your, because not everybody's going to have the same procedures too. So it'd be really hard for me to put a, an actual page limit on it when some procedures are just going to be longer than others. Um, and then Emily, I see your question about Thursday. So Thursday we can do, we'll do this again. Any questions you guys have? Um, I just am anticipating fewer people, fewer questions. So I'm, we'll do it at nine and we'll go straight through office hours instead. Um, so nine to 1130 on Thursday. All right. Um, any, any review questions? Um, apparently, for those of you who are baseball fans, um, I don't know, was it today? Almost. Um, so 20 years ago was uh, when Randy Johnson hit, hit a pigeon with a fastball. That happened uh, April 15th of, uh, of 2001, according to my quick quick Google search. Um, and if you have never seen that video, you should watch it. It's not gory or anything because the bird just disappears. It's like a person getting hit with a with a freight train. There's just not not much left afterwards. Anyway, that's a random fact that I just just happened across in my Google feed. Cool, Sean. Thanks. I'm going to get out of here. All right. Sounds good. Anybody else still working on stuff, feel free to just hang around or um, jump into the office hours link on um, the, and I'll be in the office hours link from whenever we're done here until, until 1130. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Did we just go over the ranking of the alcohols again? Yes. So that is not something I feel strong in. So the more, more resonance is going to mean more acidic because you're stabilizing that your product then. And so if we look at three similar cases, and we look at, if we look at the deprotonated form of these two cases, um, so in both of these cases, we have resonance that's gonna stabilize it, but the benzene ring has a lot more resonance. You have three pi bonds that can all resonate in there. So this one would be more acidic because the, the deprotonated form is more stable. If we don't, and, and resonance is the number one thing we're looking for. That's the most important part of this. If we don't have any resonance, we're talking about primary versus secondary, then it's all about electron density. Whatever has more electron density is going to be more acidic. 
and um, methyl groups, alkyl groups, donate electron density. They're electron donating groups. So if you have more electrons, more electron density on the oxygen, it basically grabs the hydrogen tighter because the hydrogen is going to have a positive charge when it leaves, right? So more electron density means the hydrogen is basically more stuck. It means the glue holding it together is stronger. So this would be less acidic than, say, methanol. This is going to have less electron density, so it's easier to pull a hydrogen off. Right, so number one thing to look for is resonance. But if there's no resonance, then you're looking for um, primary is going to be more acidic than secondary. Secondary is more acidic than tertiary. But I mean, at what point does that balance, like, um, at what point does, like, the resonance be outdone by the electronegativity then, or is it just always resonance first? Like if it's like the benzene ring will always be the most acidic. Um, the benzene ring will always be the most acidic. Um, and then and then allylic will be more acidic than than any kind that doesn't have any resonance. Okay. So the resonance is just is the by far the larger component. Okay. Okay. It's sad, always satisfying when I get to give you an always answer, right? That that never happens. It's very nice. Um, and then I know like do you, so I feel like last year you would give us the answer key before we turn this in just to see that we were doing it, but I feel like not being able to check our answers before we turn it in, like is that at all possible? Like would you be willing to give us like the answers for this test just because like I don't, I don't know. I feel like I'd like to know that I'm doing it right and be graded on this before I take the actual final. Yeah, that's, um, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, I just have to, to write it and, and upload it for you. Um, yeah, I mean, like I'm done. I did, I did all my stuff. I just, um, there's just certain things even too, like the next, the next one, like which ones are actually which just to make sure that I'm like looking at it correctly. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and those ones, I might upload it in sections because the um, the mechanisms just take longer to write out. There's more writing, so yeah, totally. Well, I mean, um, even like with the next section, like, can I just like tell you what how I ordered them and tell me if I'm correct? For the alcohols. For the classify each of the following reactions. Oh yeah. Vocabulary. Because I know like some of them I was a kind of like a little iffy on and I just want to make sure. Let me. Yes, and I just to get keep everybody satisfied while I have to write this myself. I'll I'll write them down on here as well. And you can keep keep track. So go ahead. You why don't you tell me what you have and I'll write them down. Um for G, I put a high uh, for number one, I put G for hydride reduction. Good. Um, the next one I have E, the sigmatropic rearrangement. Good. Uh, and then I did D for electrocyclization. Mm -hmm. And then C, cycloaddition. F is a Grignard reaction. And A, I put ether formation. Good. Yeah, that looks good to me. That looks right. Okay. Because, yeah. um, I was a little bit confused because I guess um, the second one I was like kind of stuck that it was E or D, but then it's I assume I did it right off of that. And then just some other ones too. Like I just want to make sure I'm just doing it. like it's, it's a simple yeah. stuff because usually on tests I mess up on stupid simple things. It's not like big concepts. It's just like small minor details that I lose points on. Yeah, um, I I totally get that, and I will give you guys a key, um, and that's. That's one of the reasons why I don't like multiple choice tests. 
it's, you know, they're easier, easier to write, easier to grade, eas faster for you guys to take a lot of time, but it's um, also easier for you to make dumb mistakes and get zero credit for it. Um, so, you know, while there will be some matching stuff like this and some ranking stuff, um, I'm not going to grade it too harshly. And, um, you know, just once, once you've checked your practice test and you know that, okay, I got all these right, you can use that. Okay, what was, you know, write out your logic on it so that when you can check your test test before you turn it in too. So on the, on the quick ones like that, and, and that yeah, should help. Like something that Carl said last year is like, um, practice makes permanent. So if we're doing it wrong, we're gonna learn it wrong. And if I don't have a correction, then I'm gonna continue to do it wrong. Exactly, I really like that phrase as well. And I, I totally agree. So I'll get that to you guys as soon as I can. It was just not on my radar, so I don't have it ready. No, totally. And then um, I still need to work on my lab final quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I was planning on trying to just work on that for the rest of the day and then Wednesday and then on Thursday could kind of probably pop in and be like, does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, frankly, it my my logic, if I was doing a class like this, my my logic would be I'm going to get the test test done as fast as I can. And just and then when I run out of time on the lab final, that's what I turn in. Um, and I might not get as much time on it as I want, but that way I don't run out of time to take my final final because I spent too much time on the lab final because the lab final is one of those where you could spend you could spend another week on it and still not be satisfied with it. So a deadline is helpful with that. So get, you know, make sure you leave yourself time there. Um, and don't be afraid to turn, just turn in what you have when you get to the, the end of your motivation for the finals week. <laughs> um, and then that's due on Friday night, correct? Um, officially earlier, the earlier, the better, because then I can start grading earlier. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's the official deadline. I would set yourself an internal deadline before that. Thursday. Um, Thursday. The lap finals is Thursday. All it's right. Thursday. So on, on Canvas, I think I have it set for Friday, though. If it's not, then I will set it as Friday. Okay. Because, yeah. Thurs Thursday is what you should aim for. Just okay. because the end of finals week is so draining. And you just want to be done with things that if you can be done on Thursday then that's a good idea to be to yeah, do it so. Does. And I also okay. find like winter quarter towards the end to be my least motivated time of the school year because it's just like there's so much more to go and we've already been doing it for such a long time and like with winter, yeah. I totally agree. Um, everybody's just sort of over it right now myself included this is the hardest time for your instructors to stay motivated too because i just want snow to melt and to be able to go walk around outside and also i think it's this week is like a year of zoom classes it is yeah, yeah. we've we've come a long way since then but still less than ideal the library i'm kind of bummed we still have like oh, yeah. normal society yeah. it's not mad max yet no it hasn't totally fallen apart yet <laughs> um, but that, that is a good, a good study tip for, um, you guys can go to the library at this point, um, and use their internet for two hour chunks. They're limiting it still socially distant, but if you wanted to go there, use, use their internet, just be in a different place. Um, you know, they still will not let you check out a study room or anything or work with other people, but, uh, you could, if you arranged a time for both of you guys to be there or for you know, a study group to be there at the same time, you could conceivably do that, just spread yeah. out. Because that could I just be like, be and Elkie never quarantined from each other? <laughs> I don't think that they'll let that fly, but <laughs> um, I don't know if you, if you convinced them. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Um, but yeah, and they, they made it the two hour time block too, so that you can go there for lectures and not have to worry about bad internet connection stuff for, for next quarter as well. So you could go there, sit for two hours or take your test if you're worried about your internet connection for the test as well. Is that, yeah, I thought that was happening in like May or was that March and I just misread it? Maybe it's I, May. I don't know. It's, it's for next quarter though. I'm pretty sure I saw on Instagram. Yeah, no, it was March. Um, I, and I, not sure if they got it all the way open for finals week, but I think they did. I think you're right, Elke. I just had forgotten about it. So double check that online before you just show up at there, show up there. But they're trying to open some of the resources for you guys. 
um, on campus there. Sean, do you need a break before office hours? Uh, we just had a break. I can answer some questions right now, but it's it's um it's a quick question. Yeah. Um and and it's also, I mean, you told me not to worry about the procedures too much, but um but it is a procedural question. Um I'm just not sure how to um purify my um like one of my reactions. Um, and I can't really find anything online about it, but it's liquid um, bromine and um, cyclopentane and sodium hydroxide, I think. And I'm, I'm not sure. I saw something online about just um, like using like a filter, just like a paper filter, but I'm not really sure what that would filter out. I'm not sure if there's going to be any like chunks or anything right so if you're going to make a solid then you can do a recrystallization and then just do a filter paper mm -hmm. a vacuum filtration but I if you don't know if i'm making a solid so so look up the compound that you're making see if it's going to be solid at room temperature or liquid okay um and if it's going to be a solid then then the ideal way to do it would be to, to get it to form to crystallize out as a solid and then you would realistically you would do two two vacuum filtrations you would filter your crystals first mm -hmm. to get rid of everything that's still dissolved and then you would do a recrystallization with the last step of which is then you filter it again okay. um, and that's gonna that's gonna purify your crystals so that there's very little other stuff in there um okay. so that's the if it's a if it's a solid that's by far the most common way to purify is to do a recrystallization Okay. If it's a liquid, then you would do a, a solvent extraction or something like that. Okay. Um, and so those are a little bit, those are a little trickier, but we also spent more time with them in, you know, talking about salt, you know, liquid, liquid extraction. So mm -hmm. um, Let's see. yeah, give, give it your best go. And if you're not sure, it's like, I've looked this up and it said it was a solid at room temperature. So I'm going to say, I'm going to recommend recrystallization. Okay. And that's the sort of thing that in lab we would go through and try it once and if it didn't work if it was still liquid or still stayed dissolved then we would have to come up with some other option but it's a, it's a good first guess okay um let's see what is room temperature in calvin 298 okay it's liquid <laughs> Right. Okay, but if it if it has a if its crystallization point is above is uh, above zero Celsius, you could still maybe you need to use an ice bath to get it to crystallize. A lot of these are going to melt right around room temperature, so you might be surprised. I don't see I like it, I don't see it ever being in a solid state. Does What's the compound? Um, it's cyclopentene. Maybe I'm not looking at a good website. No, you you might be cyclopentene. That that is a compound that doesn't have a cyclopentadiene. Yeah, you're not going to get there. It's negative one thirty five Celsius. Okay. Um. So you just have to do a a liquid liquid extraction. Use a separatory funnel. It's going to be super nonpolar, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if you put if you have the sodium hydroxide or and bromide as being your your byproducts, those are all going to be super soluble in water, right? So this will stay dissolved in diethyl ether or hexane or whatever your nonpolar solvent is, and then everything else will go into the water phase. And you can consider that to be um, a good enough purification for this first step. And then when you get to a step where you make a solid, then you could do your recrystallization. Okay, so liquid liquid extraction, I'm just gonna add water to my beaker or whatever and- So to a separatory funnel, remember separatory funnels are those ones that are conical uh -huh. um, that have a valve at the bottom. And so then you would make two layers and you'd have a water layer that's gonna have all your impurities. Mm -hmm. 
And then you're going to have a, your nonpolar layer based on whatever solvent you used is going to have your cyclopentene. Okay, nonpolar layer. Um, and that, that can be any nonpolar solvent. Doesn't matter. Or should no. I make sure it's on the list? Pick something from the list. Um, you could you you wouldn't want to use like acetone or something because you want to use something that's not going to mix with the water. Mm -hmm. So like hexane is a good option. Diethyl ether is a good option. Sure. Um, but you don't want to use something like acetone that'll that'll then mix with the water. Okay. And do I need do I need to figure out how many like how much of that or in rough amounts? Mm -hmm. Um. You know, you want to, you want your, you know, if your starting material is liquid mm -hmm. and your product is liquid, you don't necessarily need um, a separate solvent um, because the cyclopentene, you would want to double check that it's, that it's not going to mix with water, which if you're unsure about any of these things, it's not on a lot of times it's on wikipedia it'll say it'll have a section on solubility i'm not seeing that for cyclopentene but usually the solubility in water is going to be a very small amount um from so cyclopentane is going to have similar solubility and cyclopentane is 156 milligrams for every liter of water it's insoluble in water. So it's basically completely insoluble. Yeah. Um, so you can just say, okay, well, you know, the nonpolar layer is my product then. You just, you would basically wash it with the water. The water is going to carry all your leftover okay. reactants. Okay. And what's left over is going to be your cyclopentene. Okay. So I don't need a new layer or a new solvent. Yeah. Oh boy, this is confusing. <laughs> I feel like I'm missing stuff every time I like get back into it. I'm like, oh wait, no, and now I have to purify it. And it's gonna be a bit long. Yeah. It is. Um case Casey was one who asked about if we had yeah. uh a page length on it. His is already at 11 pages and his might be more detailed. Again, it's gonna depend on what your exact synthesis is. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not an unreasonable length okay. for this. Yeah, mine's um, not near eleven pages. <laughs> Maybe two. It's, Eleven's probably a little bit on the on the long side. There's probably a couple places where where it could be pared down, but it's not an unreasonable length. Um, depending, look if you look at some of the um, steps you guys have to do. So, mm -hmm. again, give it your best shot. Flesh it out where you can to add as many, you know, as much of the the the. Um, process as possible, but where you're not sure what to do, then take take a guess and and put it in. Um, are you available to like peer review that at all? Because uh, I like this is my first time ever writing something like this, and like I'm not sure about the language and like I can like I can copy Matias, but um. I'd like, I don't know, I'd like someone to read it that knows what they're reading. Or if you have like an um, English tutor that does a lot of science papers or you. <laughs> um, you know, the, I would ask Erina, the chemistry tutor, she did this project last year. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what her hours are during finals week, but uh, she should be available by email and she, um, if you can't make it the same time, the time that she has, mm -hmm. um, but, she, and hers was the, my second choice. I didn't want to give you hers and Matias because they're lab partners and work together. It was going to wind up being very similar yeah. to the same yeah. thing. Um, but, uh, she would definitely be available to do that. Um, okay. I can, I'll text her. I don't want to give you like a full on rough draft overview of it because then I'm just going to wind up grading it twice in one in in a week. Um, but if you have like specific wording that seems weird to you, so is there, you know, you can always send me an email. Is there a better way to say this or something like that on little bits and pieces? Okay. All right. If that sounds reasonable. Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. I'll see you at office hour as well. 
All right, sounds good. Okay. Anybody else have anything else they want to go over right now? Uh, thank you, Sean. I'm good. I'll probably see you on Thursday. All right, sounds good, Emily. Thanks, Sean. Casey, how's it going? Good, and yourself? Doing well. Good. What can I do for you? I, I don't think anything right now. I'm just trying to uh, do the stoichiometry after I figured out how to purify everything. But, and, uh, you know, I might, using the term, somebody else asked me about this yesterday, using the term stoichiometry might have, um, can lead you guys down the wrong path because it's not really like any of your ratios or anything but one to one. It's more about using the, the percent yields for all of them. But just remember, they're all going to just compound. Um, so you can basically, any steps you have in a row, you can just take those and multiply them together, basically, because it works just like with probability. If you want, if you have three coin flips and you want to know the probability that all three are heads, you've got a 50 50 shot and then a second 50-50 shot, and then a third 50-50 shot, right? So you right. could take 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 to get your overall percentage for that. You can do the same thing with percent yields. So just when you get all of your steps laid out, it's like, okay, this is a 0 0.65 times 0.95 times 0.65 to get your overall percent yield. Um, and you should be, should be good to go with that. So... Okay. Um, Don't I'm read into it too much. Try not to. I just wanted to make sure I was doing it correctly. But um, I wanted to check in. I can't find anything on um, percent yield for distillation. What can I assume for that? The reason you can't find anything is because it varies wildly depending on, on how close the two boiling points are, how hard are you heating it below, you know, because if you if you heat it really fast, you can distill it really fast, but you're going to lose a lot out the top too. Um, generally speaking, you can assume pretty high yields for distillation. Um, you always want to assume like 10% waste is a good. If you're not sure what to do, it's it's like this in construction too. If you're ever you know renoing a house or something, you always order 10% extra mm -hmm. to account for waste. 10% um, is a good number, good round number. That's a good ballpark for any any steps you're not sure about. Okay. Um, you can assume like 90% yield. Okay, perfect. Um, I feel like there was something else. Oh, I noticed that um, one of my products, let me see if I can pull it up. I have to keep an ice bath, but the other side of the um, distillation is going to have to be heated is that okay as far as a step yeah it's if you're if you're trying to do a distillation you've got to heat one side but then if your product is going to is going to evaporate too easily uh, sometimes what they'll do is they'll even run ice water through the condenser it's a lot it's a trickier setup because you have to set up like an immersion circulator like um, mm -hmm. from a from a kitchen um with an ice bath that's pulling ice water and it circulates it through and comes back um, so we try not to do that. And the way we can get around that is by having the receiving vessel in an ice bath. And so you run cool water from the tap through the condenser. Um, that's all, that's all totally legit. That's yeah. Okay. Standard Perfect. operating procedure. Perfect. Um, so I know we don't have PCC and then the, uh, dichloromethane on our list. We okayed that on my end, right? Yes, no dichloromethane, way dichloromethane should be on there as a solvent, if nothing else, because it's not really a reactant. Um, so the, the PCC, that's, yeah, go ahead and, and you can use that. Just make a note of, like, we would need to special order this or something in there. Um, gotcha. Role play it a little bit. But. Oh, sounds good. I just wanted to make sure, because I know for ours, we were talking that um, there was the theoretical way I could use ozone and stuff like that, but it's too complex for the gas molecules with propane. Right. Yeah. When you have two gases reacting together, it probably makes more sense to just use a different approach. Cool. I think that's all the questions I had so far. If I see anything else, I might bop it into the uh, lab portion. All right. Um, just remember to go to the office hours link for it. I'll just be in the office hours the whole time from, from here on out. 
Okay. Cool. See you later. Thanks, Sean.